Hey everyone, I'm Mariana and I am back with another monthly wrap up. I haven't seen you guys in a couple of weeks and that is directly related to why my background is a little bit different. Some of you may recognize these shelves from a while ago before I changed to a darker background, but basically we bought a new place and we moved. And if you have gone through these things, you know that that kind of just takes over your life for a while. But we are all settled in now, so I am finally able to film again. I apologize if some of the sound and lighting is a little bit off. I'm still trying to figure it out because this place has quite different acoustics from the previous place, and also there is a ton of natural light, so... That has been interesting, but anyways, I will keep playing with it and you guys let me know in the comments what you think about how everything looks. So as you may have guessed, in today's video, I'm going to be talking about everything that I've read and watched throughout March. And as always, I will have timestamps in the info box below if you want to skip around the video and get to a specific section. And also everything I talk about will also be linked in the info box below, so don't forget to check that out. I am, of course, going to be starting with the books, and March was actually a really solid reading month for me. I ended up reading seven books, which, before you ask me, Mariana, how did you have time to read seven books but didn't have time to film at the end of the month? Well, don't worry, more than half of these were audiobooks because I may not have had time to sit down with a book and actually have some reading happen, but I had all of the time in the world to be listening to audiobooks while packing and doing other preparations for the move. So, yeah. So, the first book that I finished in March was Ready Player One by Ernest Klein. This was actually a reread. I read this for the first time in 2014, and by read this, I mean I listened to it because the audiobook narrated by Will Wheaton is excellent. I wanted to reread this because the movie was coming out at the end of the month, and I really wanted to revisit this novel before seeing the movie. That was back when I thought that I would actually have time to go to the movie theater at the end of the month. Silly me. If you somehow don't know what Ready Player One is about, which I feel like most people do at this point, but if you don't, this is a fun, adventurous, and nostalgic novel about a young guy named Wade Watts who is living in the future, which is quite dystopian. Basically, in this future, people spend most of their lives playing this virtual reality video game and they go to school in this game, they go to work in this game, and they also do fun stuff. Everything changes when the creator of this game dies and he wills all of his fortune as well as the ownership of this game to the one person who finds the ultimate easter egg within the Oasis, which is the virtual reality slash game that everybody is playing. And this is filled with 80s references and 80s nostalgia. It is very action-packed, and I absolutely loved this book when I read it the first time. However, I have to say that upon rereading it, I kind of enjoyed it less. Now, don't get me wrong, I still thought all of the 80s references were fun and it was very fast paced and the adventurous spirit of it was really excellent. However, it was kind of difficult for me to get past the very basic language used in this book and I understand that the writing itself is not the point of the novel, but I guess I have become a more experienced reader since 2014, which is normal and it'd be weird if I didn't. So to me, the characters and their really immature dialogue and how plain the writing was really took away from my enjoyment. So I ended up going down to four out of five stars for Ready Player One. I initially rated it five out of five and it was one of my favorite books of 2014, but I think that I now understand some of the criticisms that people have had throughout the years for Ready Player One and Ernest Cline's writing. And before I kind of thought that they were just being really picky, but 
I kind of get it now, but still, this book is excellent. If you somehow have not read it, I highly, highly recommend it. I also got through the entire Wayward Pines trilogy by Blake Crouch. I have been meaning to read more Blake Crouch ever since I finished Dark Matter last year. You guys might remember that I really loved that book, so Wayward Pines seemed like a good place to go. Well, actually, it's not. It's not a great place to go. I have not seen the TV series, so if you guys have read the trilogy and have seen the TV series, let me know if I should check it out. I've heard some mixed things about the series. But anyways, the three books in the series are Pines, Wayward, and The Last Town. I listened to all three of them on Audible. And by the way, guys, if you're not using Audible, I highly recommend you give them a try. I do have a 30-day trial with a free audiobook for you. I will leave all of the information in the info box below. So if you have been meaning to give them a try and would also like to support my channel by doing something for absolutely free and get a free audiobook, definitely check out all the information in the info box below. Back to Wayward Pines. This is a fast-paced thriller with a twist, and I unfortunately cannot tell you what the full premise is because the twist is revealed at the end of the first book. And I think that would be a big spoiler for me to tell you what is actually going on there. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Our main character here is Ethan, and he finds himself in the small town of Wayward Pines, but soon realizes that he actually can't leave for some reason. And also, there is definitely something strange going on. So for the majority of the first book, you are kind of following his journey and trying to figure out what is going on here. Personally, I did not predict the twist and when the reveal happened, I was kind of really surprised. I will say that Ethan's character is actually my main issue with this entire series because as much as the plot and the twists really carry these books and they're definitely enough to keep you reading, I mean, come on, how often do you get through the entire series in one month? I don't think I've ever done that with a book series. But Ethan as a protagonist, Protagonist is very, very bland. He is very uninteresting, and his main kind of function in this series is to be either confused or frustrated, which is understandable. If I were to find myself in this situation, I would also be confused and frustrated, but you really don't get a sense of his personality, of who he is. He's just not that interesting, which is unfortunate because I love good characters and it was really difficult for me to connect with his character. So for the first two books, this is the main issue, but because the story itself is so interesting and the twists and where everything goes is just fascinating and everything is very well paced, as I mentioned, you you really don't get to worry about his character too much. That's why I ended up giving the first two books four out of five stars, and I would actually give the series overall four out of five stars. Very solid recommendation from me. The third book, The Last Town, I enjoyed a little bit less. I ended up giving it three and a half out of five stars. The reason why is because there is another element to the third book that is kind of unnecessary drama that's masquerading as character development that's just too little, too late, and really is unnecessary, and I would have preferred a little bit more time spent with kind of the meat of the twist that we encounter back in book one, which there was a lot more there to be explored. So... For me, that was the weakest book of the series, but it's still very enjoyable and I cannot recommend the series enough. Basically, if you're looking for a fast-paced thriller with a twist that will keep you reading, the Wayward Pines trilogy is definitely for you, especially if you're someone who prefers 
plot-driven stories over character-driven stories. This is definitely that type of thing, and I think you will really enjoy it. It is solid throughout, even though there are some minor issues that I personally had. I also finally read Good Omens by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, which I have to say, I like the idea of this book more than the book itself. Don't get me wrong, this is a very quirky and fun and enjoyable book, but I really wanted to love this, and so many people love this, but I just, I didn't love it. I, I thought it was good but it wasn't great. It wasn't my new favorite novel. The premise behind this is that the Armageddon is now approaching, the Antichrist has been born. However, two friends, an angel and a demon, have grown to be very comfortable with their earthly lives. So they may not want to help the Armageddon happen. The writing itself is hilarious, and there are so many moments in this book that are just so clever, and I really was loving the beginning of this in particular. While we were setting everything up and we were meeting the characters, the two lead characters are just hysterical. The final about third of the book was something I really enjoyed as well, and I did really like the ending. I thought it was very fitting, but the whole middle section of Good Omens just did not work for me. I thought it was just kind of okay. It had its moments. There was a lot of stuff that had to do with this group of kids that I really could have done without. I didn't find that interesting at all because all I wanted to do is to get back to the angel and the demon because they are so much fun. I could just watch a show or read a novel, which there is going to be a show based on this. I am so excited to watch it. I think I'm going to like the show more than I like the book. But anyways, I would love to just read about their adventures and them living their lives without this whole Armageddon Antichrist stuff, because I think that would be a lot of fun. But yeah, this book turned out to be just very uneven for me, and I have a suspicion that I may not be a fan of Terry Pratchett, which I know is blasphemy. I feel like I could tell where the Neil Gaiman sections were and where his imagination was kind of inserted, and I really loved those sections, and I tried to research a little bit, I think I'm correct, but stuff that felt kind of off and unfamiliar to me, I feel like it belonged to Terry Pratchett, so I don't know if I'm going to be reading any Terry Pratchett anytime soon, but I ended up giving this three and a half out of five stars. Once again, it is clever, it is smart, it is really funny. I just think that it kind of drags on a lot in the middle and uh, maybe this is not for everyone. Certainly it was not 100% for me, even though I really, really like the idea behind this. For my classic of the month, I actually went for a sci-fi classic and that was Solaris by Stanislaw Lem. This is a Polish science fiction author. I have read this book a very long time ago in school. I attempted to read it in Polish and um, my Polish was not good enough to <laughs> really appreciate this novel, so I didn't really remember a lot about it, and this pretty much I do not consider to be a reread. I have also seen both of the film adaptations, but once again, it has been quite a while, so reading this actually felt like discovering a whole new novel, and I have to say I absolutely loved it. It is a masterpiece, and I will fight anyone who tells me that this book is not good. I will. I will fight you. The premise revolves around Chris, who arrives at the planet of Solaris, and he finds something that he wasn't expecting to find. Basically, the crew that was supposed to be there is a mess, somebody is dead, other people are acting very strangely, there is clearly something strange going on, and there is also this sentient ocean on the planet because 
You know, traditional portrayal of aliens is just boring. Sentient ocean and not knowing what it wants and why it's there is way more interesting. I don't want to reveal too much about the novel because it is definitely best to discover things about it as you read it because I don't want to start telling you more about the strange things that are happening on the station, on this planet, but let's just say a lot of it has to do with memories and possibly commenting on how they affect us and what they can do to us. It's a very kind of extreme case of that. The only thing that I can think of that people may not enjoy as much about this novel is that the fictional science of solaristics, which is based around this alien planet, is quite present in the short novel. There are sections that just talk about the science and what has been researched about this planet and about the ocean. And I think if you're more into plot-driven sci-fi and you don't really want to dig deeper into the science part of science fiction, you may find this a little bit less interesting than the rest of the story. But I found the entire thing fascinating and I love how the author made me feel that this was a real thing and a real planet and potentially a real science. It was so immersive. I loved everything about it. I ended up giving it five out of five stars and I would love to read it again. I will definitely be revisiting it. Now, a note on the edition. I listened to it as an audiobook, particularly because this is the definitive translation of this novel. Apparently, the English translation that is available in physical format is actually something the author has commented on negatively quite a bit. He was fluent in English and he really felt like the English translation was not good at all. However, this new translation, which I do believe is only available on audiobook, is something that has been approved by his estate and it definitely flows really really well i have not read the other translation but this one was definitely very very good so i do highly recommend this particular edition of the book and i really hope they end up printing it because i would love to add it to my actual book collection somewhere behind me the last book that i finished in march was all the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr, and I have been looking forward to reading this for quite some time, but oh man, I did not have the same experience with this as a lot of people because I know so many people love this novel. I think I made a mistake reading this so close to finishing The Book Thief because there are definitely some parallels between the two. Not just because these are both set during World War II and have to do with kids. This particular novel has a blind girl and a German boy. And I'm not trying to say that this is a ripoff or that Anthony Doerr specifically tried to copy The Book Thief, not at all. But there are parts of this novel that just echo the book thief so much and it was really difficult for me not to compare the two so I did end up comparing the two as I was reading and um Unfortunately, this was not my favorite book of the month. By far, the strongest aspect of this novel is the writing. It is just so vivid and so rich, and the imagery is just so present. It makes you really visualize everything that is going on. There's some very strategic foreshadowing going on, and it is, it is beautiful. I think the writing here is very, very strong, and you can tell that from from the very first page. I was in love with the writing right away. I also really appreciated how well the author was able to show that the war really ruins everybody's lives. And you may think that there are choices out there and you can be the hero in any situation, but really sometimes your choices are 
not real choices and they're made for you. That being said though, my biggest struggle with this was probably the pacing. I thought this was very uneven and some parts just felt really drawn out. I am actually someone who enjoys reading historical fiction that is said during wartime, but this just, I, I just didn't love it. I ended up giving it three and a half out of five stars because I think there's a lot to appreciate about this book and I think I do understand why so many people love this. It is easy to see why, especially with the magnificent writing. However, for me, this was definitely lacking and I wanted a lot more from this novel. Moving on to TV shows, I have finished two TV shows in March, which by the way, thank you so much to everyone who has recommended short TV series to me after my previous wrap up. I have an awesome list of TV shows to check out that aren't going to take me seasons and seasons of catching up. So thank you so much for all of your recommendations. You guys are awesome. The first show that I finished was Dark and I actually started watching that in February, but the majority of it was watched in March. I was determined to finish it because I don't know why I didn't finish it right away. I was really into it to begin with, but basically Dark is a German Netflix original series. So yes, you do have to read some subtitles, but I promise you it is absolutely worth it. This show is one of the best shows I have seen in a while. Now, I am going to mention the premise because I feel like people are making a huge mystery out of the premise of the show for no reason. I think actually knowing what kind of show this is will sell a lot of people on watching it. So if you don't want to know anything about Dark and you just want to know if it's actually worth the hype, yes, it's absolutely worth the hype. Go watch it and then you can skip over to when I'm talking about the next show, I guess, because I am going to talk about the premise a little bit. No spoilers, I promise. None of what I'm going to say is a spoiler, but if you don't want to know anything, then you probably want to skip ahead a little bit. Basically, this is a mystery with a science fiction twist. This is set in a small German town where a boy disappears, but even though everybody's wondering where is this boy? The real question is, when is this boy? And if that doesn't sell you on the show, then I guess nothing will. This is the type of series that handles a lot of storylines and has them eventually come together, but you do kind of have to go with it for a few episodes to see how they all start converging. There's a huge cast. You have a lot of characters that are somehow connected. It is fascinating. And also the cinematography in the show is out outstanding. It is such a beautifully shot series. I loved every minute of it. The issues that I had with Dark were really, really minor, and I don't really want to talk about them because they have to do with specific plot points that happen later in the show, so that would be spoilers not going to discuss it, but I promise you there is nothing major to worry about here. I will say that I wish people would stop comparing this to Stranger Things. There is nothing Stranger Things about Dark. They're completely different stories. They have completely different goals, completely different themes. There is no reliance on nostalgia when it comes to Dark, whereas Stranger Things is very nostalgic and very reminiscent of things that we already love. They're just so different. And the only reason people compare them is because there is kind of a bit of an 80s thing going on in dark. And also there are some young adults or I guess high school age kids, which are young adults in the show. But that's literally it. Those are such general things that I just, I don't think the two shows should be compared. And I think comparing the two and trying to say that this is like Stranger Things in any way is doing the show a disservice. If I wanted to give season one of Dark a rating, I would probably go with 
four and a half out of five. It was really, really close to five out of five for me. I did have some minor nitpicks. Like I said, I don't want to discuss them because they have to do with the plot, but it was excellent. Please watch it if you haven't yet. It is worth your time. The other show that I watched, which was also a Netflix series, was American Vandal. And I'm not going to lie, when I first heard of the premise of the show, I did not think I was going to like it. But this show is just so freaking funny. This is a mockumentary series that is pretty much a satire of all of these crime documentaries that have become so popular in the recent years. Think Making a Murderer and all of those. So the premise here is that in this high school, somebody has vandalized a bunch of vehicles and drew bright pink huge dicks on these vehicles. And so throughout the series, they investigate who did this in a very serious way. Even though it may sound like it's not that funny and it's kind of silly, I thought it was going to be not my cup of tea because I generally am not a fan of kind of below the waist humor and I thought that's what it was going to be. No, it is making fun of the crime documentaries and it is just spot on. Basically, everybody thinks it's this one kid who did this. He's a troublemaker. He's not the smartest guy in school he's your typical dude bro as I like to say but he says he didn't do it he says you know I appreciate this this prank but not my prank and so yeah the whole series revolves around investigating who drew the dicks just trust me on this one if you are like me and you have watched your fair share of crime documentaries and have enjoyed them check this out and you will understand why i thought it was hysterical it is really really good and i really hope they do make a season two about something else just equally ridiculous because this was spot on as far as the satire goes. And finally, onto the movies. I did not watch that many movies in March. As I already mentioned, I was hoping I would be able to get out to the theaters and actually watch some current releases that I was interested in. Yeah, no. I did not go to the movie theater at all in March. But let's take a look at my Letterboxd. And if you don't follow me on Letterboxd, I'm Impression Blend on there. And if you want to know what I'm watching, when I'm watching it, and what I think of these things, then you should definitely follow me on this website. So the first movie I watched in March was Happy Death Day, which is essentially a Groundhog Day type of horror movie. It's about this girl who wakes up on her birthday and gets murdered then starts her birthday all over again and it just keeps happening and she's trying to figure out what the hell and who is murdering her. I thought this movie was okay as you can tell by my rating. I gave it two and a half out of five stars. I feel like this either needed to be a lot scarier like a legitimate horror movie which this wasn't really that scary at all or this needed to go into full on horror comedy mode and be completely ridiculous. I think it kind of attempts to do both and succeeds in neither. It's just kind of very average is what I'm trying to say and I definitely would not recommend it. Then I watched Brigsby Bear, which I think is one of the most underrated films of 2017. I have probably heard a whole of two people talk about this movie on YouTube and it deserves way, way more attention because it is truly excellent. Brigsby Bear is about James, who is a huge fan of a children's TV show, Brigsby Bear, and it essentially has to do a lot with fandom and just the pure love that you have for a fictional character and a fictional story, no matter how old you are, no matter what your circumstances are, something that stays with you. And I think a lot of us are fans of something, so a lot of us will be able to relate to this. The situation that this movie presents is quite complicated and um, I don't exactly know how I feel about it, but I am feeling 
a lot of things after watching this movie. It is very much an emotional experience and it is going to tug at your heartstrings. Highly, highly recommend this film. I ended up giving it four and a half out of five stars and yeah, please go watch it. Then I saw Force Majeure, which is directed by the same guy who directed The Square. And if you've seen my previous wrap up, you know, I was not a big fan of The Square. So I was a little concerned about watching this movie movie, but I'm here to report that Force Majeure is so much better than The Square. It is more focused. The plot is more interesting. It actually has something to say. It, basically, it is about this family that is vacationing in the French Alps and an avalanche happens where everybody panics and the dad kind of just abandons this family, whereas it wasn't actually as dangerous as it looked, but now his family is having a bit of a hard time knowing what happens when danger is near and how their father will react. Particularly the mother is having a hard time dealing with her husband's cowardice. And I think this movie presents some interesting points and offers not really solutions, but things to consider. This is a really good movie. It's very well shot. And if like me, you thought the square was kind of not that great, and now you are hesitant about watching the director's other movies, I think you should definitely check out Force Majeure. Ended up giving it four out of five stars. Then I watched Veronica, which was kind of every supernatural horror cliche put in one movie. I don't know who said that this was one of the scariest movies you'll ever watch. I feel like that was just a marketing tagline that caught on. But really, if you've seen other supernatural horror films before, you will not be scared by this film. You've seen it all before. And even though it's technically supposedly based on a true story, that doesn't make it any more interesting or any more original. There are some genuinely creepy moments in Veronica, but it was just average, very average. And it had some very bad CGI in it. So two and a half out of five stars. After that, I decided to rewatch Fargo, which is a film I love. It's one of my favorite films. It's from the Coen brothers. And if you haven't seen Fargo for some reason, then you just need to, you can quit my video right now and just go watch Fargo because it's way better than my video. This is the kind of movie that just grows on me every time I watch it. And I appreciate the dark comedy of it more and more. The story is just so strange but so compelling and it's very unusual and of course Frances McDormand is just outstanding the whole cast is great I don't need to sell you on Fargo I'm sure most of you have seen it and yeah just watch it again if you've seen it already because it's fantastic obviously five out of five stars then I watched 1922 which is another Netflix original Stephen King adaptation this is based on a short story and I honestly think it would have made a really good short film but as a full length feature film. It just felt like it was padded and it kept circling around the same thing over and over again. It was very drawn out. It captures the atmosphere and the setting really well and there's some good acting in there, but it just didn't do much for me. There is a central theme to it that I don't want to talk about because that kind of will spoil what happens, but just trust me on this one. If you want to watch a good Stephen King adaptation, there are much better films out there. And if you want to watch a good Netflix original movie, there are much better films out there. This is just, it's okay. It's not really worth your time. Another film adaptation that I watched in March is the adaptation of Cormac McCarthy's The Road. 
I feel a little bit conflicted about this movie. I ended up rating it three out of five stars. I think it definitely has its merits, particularly because it really did a great job capturing the bleak landscape that the book presents us with. And in case you didn't know, I freaking loved the novel. It was one of my favorite books that I read last year. But back to the movie, outside of capturing this bleak post-apocalyptic landscape, I also think thought the performance by Viggo Mortensen as the father was just perfection. But other than those two things, I just don't think they did a great job adapting this book. And it is impossible to capture this novel, in my opinion. I don't really know why they tried. It didn't capture the philosophy. It tried to a little bit, but I don't know if I would have picked up on it if I haven't read the book. And it did not capture the atmosphere as well as I hoped it would. So it is a decent film. So that's why I ended up giving it three out of five stars. I liked it, but it just, it pales in comparison to the original work, which is a masterpiece. Last but certainly not least, I rewatched it and I enjoyed it just as much as I did the first time around when I saw it in theaters. I do have a review of this on my channel, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but yeah, this is a great adaptation and in my opinion, actually better than the novel. I know, controversial, but that's how I feel. I have my Blu-ray, I have my Pennywise Funko, and I am super ready for part two to come out, which is not coming out anytime soon, but whenever it's out, I'm going to be there because I really, really enjoyed this adaptation and I need more of it in my life. So that's it for my March wrap up. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know it was probably a long one, but you guys like long videos. I thought you guys wanted shorter videos, but turns out you guys enjoy long videos as well. So I am back on track with filming now. I will have regular videos out for you starting now. So look forward to more videos coming soon. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Thank you so much for watching. As always, let me know what you have been watching and reading in March in the comments below. Please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And if you are not subscribed to my channel yet, you should definitely subscribe and also hit that notification bell so you know when my videos are out. I hope you're having an awesome day and I will see you very, very soon in my next video. Bye!